One of my working definitions of leadership when I was much younger was that you couldn't walk past a problem that wasn't being attended to and not take responsibility for trying to solve it. What does that look like when you have no experience in the subject area and it's overwhelmingly huge? Well, let's find out in our conversation with Steve Kalilia, who went from being a highly successful businessman and right at the end of his career reinvented himself to tackle world peace. Hey folks, welcome to The Evolving Leader. Scott Allender here at 5 a.m. in Nashville, along with John Gomes at a comfortable 11 a.m. And joined by our guest today, clear on the other side of the world at 8 p.m. So folks, other podcasts might claim it, but we truly are a global show. Uh, John, how are you feeling this morning? Oh, I'm feeling very grateful to be sandwiched between this kind of global audience uh, here today. Um, no, I'm feeling really excited because the topics that we're going to talk to our guest about are ones that are very pressing and uh, we haven't really talked about too much on the show, so it'll bring something new. How are you feeling, Scott? Well, I expected to feel tired, but I'm actually not. I'm buzzing with energy uh, to talk to our guest today because uh, today we're joined by the remarkable Steve Kalalia. Steve harbors over a decade's worth of award-winning experience delving into the crucial yet often misunderstood concept of global peace. Among many other things, he founded the Institute for Economics and Peace, known as the IEP, in 2007 as an independent, nonprofit global research institute analyzing the intertwined relationships between business, peace, and economic development. He's been recognized as one of the world's 100 most influential people on reducing the onset of armed violence. As one of the world's most impactful think tanks, IEP's research is extensively used by multilaterals, including the United Nations, World Bank, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, as well as thousands of university courses around the world. He's also the founder of the Global Peace Index, the world's leading quantitative measurement of global peacefulness, ranking 163 countries and independent territories. Steve, welcome to The Evolving Leader. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for the introduction, Scott. I'm looking forward to the show. Steve, welcome to the show. Uh, we're truly delighted to have you on. How are you feeling today? Yeah, pretty good. It's 8 p.m. here in uh, Sydney, so the night's moving on. I started work probably about 6 a.m. this morning, but that's not an unusual day for me. I did have a break for an hour, watched a little bit of television, had some dinner. Well, I guess it's um, it's easy to do something when you're really passionate about it, but um, re reading your bio, you've had a really impressive and meaningful career. Can you walk us through your story a bit? How did a IT entrepreneur find himself championing peace? Well, the background's actually in IT. Started off as a shy, retiring computer programmer, like nothing more than actually writing code. So I developed two computer programs, then developed two companies around each of those programs. The first one ended up listed on NASDAQ, the second on the Australian Stock Exchange. They were both publicly listed. So made quite a bit of money out of that uh, and then set up a family foundation to work with the poorest of the poor. And so that took me to a lot of war zones, near post war zones. And it's a reasonable size foundation. We've done 220 projects in different parts of the world now, about 3.6 million direct beneficiaries. Nothing like a Bill Gates, but still pretty good. And so I was in northeast Kivu in the Congo one time, looking at the funding a project there dealing with fistula tears for women. And it's one of the more violent places in the world. And I suddenly started to think, what are the opposites? of all these stressed out countries I'm working in? What, and was there anything I could learn from more peaceful countries which could bring into my projects? That was a fantasy sort of question, but a lot of great ideas start with fantasy questions, don't they? Just the mind rumbling away in the background. And so I did a search on the internet when I got back to Sydney and couldn't find anything. And that's how the Global Peace Index was born. But that creates a very, very profound question because if a simple businessman like myself can be walking through Africa and wonder what are the most peaceful nations in the world and hasn't been done, then what do we know about peace? If you can't measure something, can you truly understand it? If you can't measure it, how do you even know whether your actions are helping you or hindering you in achieving your goals? You simply don't. Hmm. So one of the first things that jumped out at me when I was learning about you and your work is that the Institute uh, for Economics and Peace aims to create a paradigm shift in the way the world thinks about peace. Um, 
So I know you don't know me, but as soon as someone says the words paradigm shift, my ears perk up like my dogs when I ask her if she wants a treat. So can you tell us about the paradigm shift that you're working to create? Sure. So it's a little bit complicated. So what we've done is saying we have the Global Peace Index. We've done a lot of mathematical modeling, statistical analysis against 50,000 different data sets, indexes, attitude on surveys to work out using empiric techniques what are the factors which create highly peaceful societies. And that's a concept we call positive peace. In other words, the attitudes, institutions and structures which create and sustain peaceful societies. So we do more mathematical modelling and then we can take a, some statistical techniques and clump them into eight different things, which forms a topology of the way peace operates. This operates as a system, and like and we'll get into this later on in the interview, I'm sure, but systems thinking is really profoundly different. But as we take positive peace, we can now create another index out of it. And then what we found is not only do those factors create highly peaceful societies, they also create a whole lot of other things which we think are important. So just give you four examples. So first one, is per capita income, countries which are improving in positive peace compared to countries which are deteriorating on average have 2% per annum higher GDP growth rate. It's also statistically associated with better performance on the ecology, better performance on measures of well-being and happiness, and better measures on inclusion, a whole range of other things. So therefore, you can say positive peace in many ways describes an optimal environment for human potential to flourish. Now, if we look at the world today, and particularly the Western democracies, and you can see this uh, both in the UK and you can see it in the US, is in many ways our systems are starting to get to sque squeaky wheels, they're starting to fray. And you can see this reflected in the, in the work we've got around positive peace. We need some way of being able to reinvigorate Western societies. And when you take the concept of positive peace, it makes it central but also provides the right environment for a whole lot of other things to flourish. And then when you combine systems into it, you're now really starting to come and think about things differently. Before we, we come to that point around the, the squeaky wheel in the West, what are, the, what are people's biggest misconceptions about peace um, that you've learned through your approach that's you know, differs from the traditional approaches to peace building and development? Yeah, there was a whole range of them. I think the first thing is that it's something which is altruistic. It's a nice uh, uh, have, but it's impractical. So peace is a relative concept. So you can go to the most troubled places in the world and you'll still find pockets of peace and people who are reasonably peaceful. You can go to the most peaceful places in the world and you're still going to find violence. So peace is a I think the first thing, it's a relative concept. It's only dependent on what you're comparing it to. So the other thing is it's practical, just as that definition I gave of positive peace then. Peace is practical and it's attainable. Now, peace is also something that you can just gradually move to when you're looking at it globally. You don't, it's not something like a switch you turn on and off. So even if you've got 10% improvement in peace globally over the next decade, let's say, now that'd be a pretty big achievement, wouldn't it? That'd mm -hmm. be a pretty big achievement. And with it, we'll get to it, I'm sure, it comes a hell of a lot of the uh, economic potential which gets unleashed. I think the final thing is people quite often see peace as being the absence of war, something when the guns fall silence. And that, again, is a bit like that light switch analogy. It's either on or it's off. And so I think they're just some of the things. They're just some of the things. So the other thing is sort of peace, in many ways, starts with the individual. Uh, so sort of if you go, yeah, then very hard to create a peaceful world if you're pretty uh, 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 traumatically uh, experience a traumatic reality yourself. Hmm. So you're touching on a lot of this already, um, but I'd love to, to stay with this a bit longer because you say in, in your book in the past that, that peace may have been the domain of the altruistic, but... In this century, it is everyone's self-interest because peace is central to a safe and productive society, which you're touching on now. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so 
Look, if we look at the major challenges facing humanity today, they're sort of global in nature. Things like climate change, ever decreasing biodiversity, full use of the freshwater on the planet. But underpinning all of them is overpopulation. And unless we get a world which is basically peaceful, we'll never get the levels of trust, cooperation, or inclusiveness necessary to solve these problems. Therefore, peace is a prerequisite for the survival of society as we know it in the 21st century. And that is different than any other epoch in human history. In the past, may have been the domain of the altruistic, but let's face it, in the 21st century, it's simply in all our own self-interest. Mm. Let's talk about the leadership challenges involved in that, because in, in, your, in the same book, you talk about that most of our leaders are still trapped in an early age, a kind of Darwinian race to compete, and that then informs how it dominates how they think about international relationships and, and, and so on. Um, in our increasingly interconnected and inter interdependent world, how should we be thinking? How should le leaders be devolving, evolving? Um, Gee, it's a, it gets hard because we're really in many ways stuck with the human spirit. So we, uh, in many ways, leaders aren't leaders. So if you think in Western in terms of Western democracies, they follow the opinion polls and the opinion polls, they're following in them. They're not truly leaders. I think a lot of the time, too, it's like we haven't got a good enough understanding of, the, let's say, just peace. If you want to create peace, you truly need to understand it. Too often leaders are thinking in terms of the force. If we can impose the right level of force, then we'll create peace. And I think all of us can see just coming out of the back of the uh, Afghanistan, that's just not going to happen. But even the most conservative estimates put the cost of the uh, war in Afghanistan at about $2.3 trillion. Do you realise that's 100 times the per capita income for each Afghani per annum? And wow. just think what would happen if you'd just given them 10 times their annual income. Think of giving everyone in America mm. 10 times their annual income. Would that make it more, would that make <laughs> it more peaceful? But back, 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 back to leadership. Uh, uh, and a lot of it comes down to we democracies elect the leaders, okay? So it really comes back to us as individuals. And quite often we are looking for strong leaders, and that's the kind of leaders we want, someone who we think is going to take and be very strong going going forward. But a lot of the time what we learn in universities these days, it doesn't take a systems approach. Everything is seen as, if you like, what's the problem? What was the cause? Let's solve it that way. But Societies don't operate like that. They operate on different principles, which we'll probably get around to in a few minutes. But leadership also, I guess, in many ways, what, who do we want as our, our, our ideal leaders? We want people who really understand the subject matter, but also are empathetic. And I think the empathetic part is quite often missing. But even if we look at leadership today in the Western democracies, and you look at the minister for such and such, a lot of the time they've got no experience in that field at all. Look at the minister for health, the minister for education, the minister mm. for defence. And they get there because there's a, there's, a, there's a hierarchy to the ministers. And, like, depending on your clout within the party, that determines which ministry you get. So the whole concept, the way we politicisation of the politics and so of leadership in many ways sort of really destroys the concept of a good natural leader. Also, I think there are two types of leaders. There's sort of one which just naturally arises, and that's because they're just good, okay, really good. We see that reflected in all sorts of uh, people, like some of the great entrepreneurs, and some of them really eccentric, like Elon Musk, but great leader, great visionary. Then there's the other people who just crave leadership because something within their personality which they think will make them feel better and they're the kind of people we don't want as leaders so let, let's just talk about this systems approach for a moment because the effect of silicon valley has been with these so-called exponential organizations has been to lord the effect of very kind of narrow problem statement led businesses you know, they're very, very good at doing this. Yeah. And actually, you know, they've created huge amounts of value and impact in certain respects and will continue to do so. But they don't tend to think at a systems level. 
Um, they're very much, you know, kind of reductive in the way that they go after things. Tell us what your thinking is around uh, the need for leaders to think at a systems level. So maybe we'll come back and I might just hit there's something philosophical, which I think is profoundly important. This comes back into why positive peace combined with the systems is transformational. So if we look today, uh, uh, we live in a causal world, cause and effect. We think about that with everything. And that's based on physics. And it goes back to empiricism, the very base of it, and great breakthroughs. Like, look, at we're talking because of these breakthrough in physics from empiricism. So it's about the study of a physical world. And so you have a cause and effect. And the effect never influences the cause. And what that does is means you can have repeatable experiments, okay? So and that's the way we build up knowledge. Now, that make, creates for cause and effect, and that's the physical world. That's built deep into our subconscious in many ways that's how we that's how we walk throw a ball up in the air and always comes down the same so this concept of a physical causal world's built, built deeply into our side you can take something and you can break it down into its constituent parts into more and more pieces now you can break it down understand it put it back together again and it'll work the same think of a clock for example would be a good example of that but systems in a biological sense, work very, 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 very differently. So the effect comes back and influences the cause. That's just called a mutual feedback loop. If you take something and you break it down into its constituent parts, you won't understand the whole because the whole is much more than the sum of its parts. Think of your human body and think of your consciousness. You're much more than the sum of your parts. And sort of a lot of the time, we look at events. So there's an event, okay? We now look at the cause of the event and then try and fix it. So let's say look at the election of President Trump in the US, for example. So everyone saw that and was looking for the causes and the reasons why. But in systems, events happen out the relationships and flows. So it's a lot more important to understand the relationships and flows through the system and affecting them. Other things like path dependency, where a great leader comes in with a great statement to radically transform everything. But societies are on this concept of path dependency, which is part of systems. I guess it's the another way of looking at it is the march of history, if you like. And so we're all seen, or we're all set on that. So societies have got a path to them. If you try and radically change them, you end up sort of smashing the society or put it at great risk. And the idea is many small changes moving in a direction you want to go because many small changes from many different directions to stimulate the system. Uh, you've got a whole range of other things, but I'll probably just stop there. But philosophically, it's that concept that's thinking away from cause and effect because, look, even our whole things are structured on them. You, what you're looking at in terms of the way you describe companies, you can look at university for example, universities are based out of that concept of empiricism, cause and effect. We started with departments, when we get sliced up into more and more finer departments to study more and more finer things. A lot of talk about systems at university, but if you want to get published, you'll be in a specific academic paper around a specific discipline, not something which is systemic. And that's the issue of our age. If you look at place, some of the really real wicked challenges so we've been we're bringing out an ecological threat report in a couple of weeks and it's focuses on a lot of the eco ecological degradation and sort of if you go and look let's say somewhere like the Sahel for example if you've got countries there which are going to more than double their population in the next 30 years they haven't got enough water now nor enough food they've got Islamic terrorist groups going in and governments which are have got to really weak inefficient systems. So how do you solve that when all the major agencies working in there work in silos? So you've got someone like FAO who looks after the food. You've got World Health Organization might be in there with the uh, you're looking after health. Then you've got the UNHCR, which are looking after the refugees. Nothing in there really doing anything about business, which I think is something missing. So there's all these things you need to bring together as a unified system to 
can start to try and solve the problems rather than working through silos. Or the military, the military which will go in and sort of in those kind of areas, you need it. If you've got Islamic terrorists, you need to fight them. But it's not integrated with the development which you need. And look at back to Afghanistan. Like how much, yeah, look at the money spent there. What it says is no amount of money is going to solve these problems unless we change the way we think. Hmm. What would have to happen to unsilo to get these these different you know organizations to integrate and is that is that it feels like a a pipe dream in a way yeah well i must admit in many ways that without getting that out of the un or out of a lot of these bodies at the moment to see pipe dream of not the term i'd use they see the need for a lot better systems approach but the problem is just that the systems They've got their own momentum and, their, and their, the various agencies got their own mm-hmm. momentum. And in their own view, they do a real lot of good, okay, and they do in their own way they do. So what's really needed is just a change of consciousness. Change of consciousness has come slowly. So let's look at it from a systems perspective. This here, me being on the program and talking, is just a small point in trying to change the consciousness. Mm. So now if we look at systems from another angle, there's concept of tipping points. So you can do, do many, many, many things and they'll only have a very small change on the system. Then finally, you'll have one more thing and then you'll hit past a tipping point. And the system then with very little energy changes, restructures and becomes different. So it's really, if you believe in this kind of change, then it's about all of us just doing things and eventually that happens. So look at the changing consciousness on climate change, okay? And if we went back 40 years ago, 30 years ago even, you'd find there were only few people who really bought into it and really believed in it. Most people thought it was something distant in the future and a lot of the science is mumbo-jumbo. But today, we all believe in it. Hmm. Change is possible. Think about think, think about the evolution of the democracy to where it is today. And, and from a systems perspective, what what was your analysis of the last five years? The rise, increase of populism, and you know what happened at Capitol Hill and so on. There was a series of things there that were beyond just Trump being appointed, uh, you know, elected. Yeah. What 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 did you see happening? So, sure. So let's look at it through the concept of positive peace. So positive peace is also associated with a whole range of other things. Uh, so one of them is resilience and adaptability. So that same same qualities create for resilience and adaptability. So the US in the last the decade has had the sixth large, sorry, it's the tenth largest drop in positive peace globally. Okay, and that's what you're seeing getting reflected. So if we look at positive peace, 75% of the countries in the world have actually improved in the last decade. Surprise, surprise. But if you now break that down, you get a bit of a different picture, as quite often does as we start to look at more detail. So positive peace is the attitudes, institutions and structures which create and sustain peaceful societies. So if we look at the structures of society, they've improved really well. So they're things like education levels, uh, your, your life expectancy, uh, your per capita income, things like that. So, so they're the structures. The institutions, of, let's say the institutions of governments, which we all know well, they're sort of mm, just sort of hung around about the same, except in a number of Western democracies like Australia, they've actually fallen backwards. And then you look at the attitudes and the attitudes of the areas where we can see there's been a profound decline, and this is globally, in the last decade. And you can see this really in the Western democracy. So you've all the, I'm going to give you six or seven things you're going to relate to really, really well. And we'll just take as, as self-evident. You've got to, you're, you're growing inequality, which you can see. You've got the concept of the group grievances on the rise. You can see that with bread exit. You can see it with the last US election, let's say. You've got concept of fractionalised elites. That's where the elites fight amongst themselves. And so they're less and less interested on the public good, more and more interested on their own wins. 
You've got rising perceptions, and I will use the word perceptions of corruption. Um, that's been that's rising globally, which is not let's say in a lot of the Western democracies. You've got less faith in the democratic systems, and you've got an increase in misinformation as well. And so they're all sort of pointing to a system. And so how do you fix this? Okay, so we'd pull this back and we'd look at it through the lenses of positive peace. And so there's eight different lenses and they all come together. So they're things like none of this is going to be sound, none of this is counterintuitive and all seems extremely obvious, but they are all important and each of them needs to be focused on, which most governments don't. They focus on one or two of these eight things I'm about to mention. So things like well-functioning government, uh, a strong business environment, equitable distribution of resources, that doesn't mean equal, it means equitable, and that's the social contract, acceptance of the rights of others. Uh, you've got the things like high levels of human capital, that's education, but more than education. You've got the things like a, a good relationships with neighbours, low levels of corruption, free flow of information, and they all come together. So just give a really simple example of just the way this operates. So we'll think of well-functioning government, free flow of information and corruption. Now, does the government affect corruption with rules and laws or does corruption affect the government through the way it operates? Does free flow of information, let's say epitomised by a free press, and we're in free flow of information now, that's what we're doing. Does that affect corruption or the way a government operates? What does the government affect the free flow of information or does corruption actually affect the free flow of information? You can't pull it apart. So mm. really, if you're going to tackle the system, you've got to tackle it from all angles. So if you've got a problem, look at it from all angles. And so I've just used three of them there and so you can imagine what happens and because anything... If almost any activity you do, you can view through those eight pillars and it'll give you a holistic view. Really, really does because it's, because it's really mathematically derived. So it's quite tight and solid. When you look at that index, um, wh who, wh where, you know, maybe they're a surprise to us, but where are the countries that are most vulnerable at the moment to being destabilized and, and for peace to, you know, be replaced by war or, or further conflict? Uh, yeah, I won't pull a country out off the top of my head, but I'll give you give you an idea of how you can use the positive peace. So you've got the Global Peace Index. It's a measure of actual peace. So if you take a, a measure, it's measures of positive peace, that's the potential of what it should be. So where the actual peace of the country is much higher than the positive peace rating, then that country is likely to drop. So if we went back a decade ago, and depending on the number of countries we pick, we can get a 70 to 90% accuracy rate, accuracy rate in the countries which are going to drop. And that's because, the, it's, the, because it's a measure of the resilience of the countries. And so they will all over time, sometimes they can take a long while, but they do tend to fall back to what, 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 where they should be. So there's a number of countries in Africa at the moment where their uh, uh, actual peace is much higher than the positive peace. But I haven't got all the countries off the top of my head, or the top ones, so I won't mention them now no. in case I got one of them wrong because that would be a tragedy for that country, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It might affect, might affect their investments. So, we don't want to put one, you on one, one, one of the interesting things, fascinating, which we found out in the last, gee, last only in the last nine months. So if you look took positive peace, and we talked about the GDP growth earlier on, that gives us a period of GDP growth. But if you put your money in the stock markets and the countries which are improving in positive peace at the fastest rates, and then put your money into, and then you looked at that compared to the global increase in world indices, you would have got a 34% better return. That's really interesting, isn't yeah. it? So, so the stuff fits right in the, the heart of uh, economics, which is something I like. Because basically it's a business, so I'm pretty practical. We asked um, uh, a guest on uh, a few weeks ago, Kevin Kelly, who was the founder of Wired magazine, um, for his 
not predictions, but thoughts about the future. And one of the things he said was, you know, uh, the need for a world government and what you're talking about, you know, these systemic issues. No one country can actually really do it, can they, anymore? No one country can yeah. actually look at these systemic issues. What, what's your thoughts or reaction to the idea of, of, of a kind of world government body? Uh, look, I like it. But to, uh, to quote Scott's words, maybe it's a pipe dream. Yeah. Uh, uh, so <laughs> and like so, let, let's let's have a look at the UN because that's the peak body at the moment. But the only people you'll find represented at the UN are governments. Okay. Hmm. So like for me, business. I, I, I you get business in there. That for, for a starter, that'd be that that'd be that just on its own would be a very big improvement. But then, how do you get representation? Uh, for, for all the different types of people around the world, it's too many, it's too vari- too much variety to actually do at that level without ending up with something which is absolutely unwieldy. But we do need better ways of being able to get better ways of being a go- governing. And I think part of it is pushing decision-making down as far as we can. There's a lot of things you can't do it with, but for a lot of things, the further you push the decision-making down, the closer they are to the people, with the people, they know themselves best what they what works best. So, like if you look at part some of the countries in Africa, it's sh- shocking corruption. But you find the corruption's less when you've got the decision making or the response, the decision making for the money pushed down closer to the local people, because then it's a lot. They can see it as being a lot more accountable than when they're voting for some leader who's heading up a nation of forty million people. And you see, you see the same thing with the Western democracies. There's a tendency today to concentrate, and like technology makes it easier to concentrate power more and more at the top. And like my sense is if we can just decentralize a lot of that, that would go a long way. I'm curious how the U.S. has fared on the index over the last sort of five years, you know, culminating in the attack on Capitol Hill. I just, you know, it feels less peaceful, less stabilized. Certainly that's an event I never thought I'd witness. I'm curious its impact on how it's been ranked. It'll have some impact. That'll come under a, a, a violent demonstrations. So it'll have an impact under that. But the US all had a, quite a few other demonstrations over the last few years, like Black Lives Matter, for example, that'd be one. We went back over the last uh, decade, we'd be back to a, a global financial crisis and you had an all like remember the occupy wall street so you had quite mm. a few around then political instability they'll come up and affect that so there's 20 23 indicators on the global peace index just thinking quickly and there might be one or two more but they'd be the two indicators which will fall because of it so the us have got an exact rank and i think it's about 100 no, about 130 out of about out of 163 countries but those 63 countries cover 99.7% of the world's population. So hmm. uh, uh, Russia, it's down in the bottom 10, for example. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, you in, and the China's roughly about the same as the US. Hmm. I mean, human nature tends to make us look, think about all the negative stuff um, and our attention goes there. Yeah, so here's one for you, and this is counterintuitive for you. So if we look back over the last decade, the number of countries which improved in peace were 86 hmm. compared to the number of countries which dropped was 75. But overall global peacefulness decreased by 2%. And that's because when you fall in peace, you fall a lot faster than when you improve, which is hmm. a lot more gradual. So a couple of other things which are really fascinating. If we look globally, there's a growing inequality in global peace. So the countries at the top are indexed, becoming more peaceful, and the countries at the bottom are becoming less peaceful. Now, there's also, when you look in the yeah, yeah, out of systems th- theory, there's a concept called attractor basins. And sort of people, there's areas which things get attracted to, if you like. And so you've got two attractor basins inside global peace. One's at the top and one's at the bottom. So once you get into the, over the time we've been doing, once you become really peaceful, you, it takes a lot to unstick you. Whereas when you become really unpeaceful, it's very hard 
to get back out of there again. So you've got these two attractor bases. And so what, and so if you look at the countries in the middle, they move around a hell of a lot more than the countries at the top and the bottom. If you're enjoying The Evolving Leader, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. And don't forget to follow along on Instagram and LinkedIn. You can find us at Evolving Leader. Thank you for listening. Now, let's get back to the show. You've said that you often compare a small startup to a baby. It's fragile, easily broken, and requires nurturing. Uh, The same analogy can be applied to a new idea. It needs to be nurtured and built up before it can be attacked. So too often, creative ideas die early because too many people only want to focus on why it won't work rather than why or rather than what can be done to make it succeed. So I'm curious about how your background, uh, your entrepreneurial background influenced the way you conceptualized and managed the IEP and went about creating the Global uh, Peace Index. Yeah, well, I never realized it. Actually, it would have been, gee, I think six years into it. And I suddenly realized all I'd done was taken the same way I'd be running an IT startup, <laughs> did it with the, uh, you did it with a uh, research institute on peace. And so very early on, by the first uh, uh, issuance of the Global Peace Index, so was like I've got this idea, okay? So I've gone around and sort of uh, got hold of a couple, of fr- couple of friends who were in, in peace, and they said, "Oh yeah, yeah, we co- we don't have anything like it." So they gave me an introduction to a couple of the leading uh, 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 peace organisations in the world. So I got on a plane, travelled around the world, saw them, and they going, "Oh yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we we think it's a good idea. Nothing like it." So then I thought I'd get it done. So I had a guy working for me at the time. He used to we, uh, run uh, 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 parts of the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, in London. So uh, he said, yeah, they're good at indexes. I'll give you an introduction there. So I developed the philosophy for it, went over, got them to produce the first one. We do them all in-house now. I've done them for oh, a long while. So it's once we built the skills up for the first one. And then so I've got the index. I thought, well, this is after I've decided to do it. And I thought, well, it's no good just doing it without getting people to know about it. So I've then hired a PR company to do the uh, the launch for it. And if you look at that, that's just the way a entrepreneurial stuff starts. So you have an idea and then you evolve it as you go. And when you're small and you're in a startup, it's, it's really easy to do. But all too often, uh, just coming back to where you started, but all too often I've found through my career, uh, uh, good ideas, a lot, a lot of people really stuck in the status quo, okay? They've been doing something for a long while and sort of their mind sort of thinks down that track. And then when presented with something new, really hard for them to change. And that's why quite often you'll find when you're looking at your really large companies, the way they grow is through acquisition because they can't really do it in-house, okay? They wait because they've got the capital to do it. They wait till not someone else with a good idea actualizes on it and buys it out at a premium uh, when it's still relatively young. It's got a hell of a, lot of, hell of a lot of growth in it. So if we look at Facebook, really, it was one idea. Everything else has been an acquisition. And you'll find sort of a lot of the stuff if you get deep down inside Google, they keep acquiring all these companies along the way. Then the stuff... And Microsoft are the same. So the stuff, quite often, which we see as an innovative within them, they've actually bought in. It's not stuff developed there. So I think, yeah, and so I think for all of us, if we're really trying to be creative about something, you've got to build an idea up. And it's a bit like sort of a baby grows to an adolescent. Then when it gets an adolescent, you can start to push it around a bit to see, see how strong it is. Before we started our show together, we we uh, we touched on a couple of things, um, and your you, you talked about uh, meditation being important in your life. Can you t- tell us a little bit about the, how you have developed yourself uh, in relation to your your own kind of worldview and and the things that you, you do to to sustain the unbelievable energy you must have to to be driving all of this? Yeah. Uh- so I'll hit it from a couple of different angles. So I guess what the first thing, like I think the first thing in life that's really important 
to do the things you like to do, okay? Because generally, when we pick something we like to do, we're picking something we're good at. And if we're good at it, we like to do it, we do a lot more of it than other people. And there's a virtuous cycle there. And at some point, we'll get very good. But the thing is, we'll be the first one to realise we're very good. It's only at some stage later that other people will realise we're good. Then we get the recognition. And finally, sometime after the recognition, we actually make the money. Too many people think, I want to make a whole lot of money. I'll get recognition and I'll feel good about myself. But it's the wrong way around. Because generally, if you think, I want to make a whole lot of money, where do you go? You go into a field which is full of other people who have already been there before you and probably got more passion for it. And it gets very, very difficult. So I think that's a mistake a lot of people make in life. But at the personal level, a uh, for me, uh, I've done, look, I've done a lot of meditation. I guess that's the major form I, I've used for self-development. That was really good. So that I look at that, my life built a huge amount of energy. Uh, it sort of certainly made me calm, made me give the ability to be able to stand a lot more stress than what I could have otherwise. And see, there is a sense of, the, I guess, out of it, a concept of equanimity. And sort of equanimity is really the ability to sort of be somewhat detached from the good and the bad. And in that, so it's a state, of, I guess, I guess you could call it bliss. And I guess that in the long run, it's really where you try to get to with meditation. But in that state, you do have the ability to generally sort of be judged somewhat better. But in saying that, I don't want to set myself up as being a guru or anything like that, because I'm certainly a long way from that. Well, how long have you been doing it for? Uh, for 40, over 45 years. Hmm. Yeah. So you would Medi- have been- yeah. and I, generally, I generally meditate a couple, couple of hours a day. Just It's automatic for me. Yeah. So what's next for you, Steve? What, you know, because you're, you're obviously thinking ahead all the time. What do you, yeah. what's, what's, so to, what's yeah, the... it's not, yeah, num, num, number, number of things. I've got a, yeah, n- number of things. So one of them is sort of when we're looking into sort of a lot of the, a lot of these really wicked development uh, issues I was talking about earlier on, particularly around the ecological degradation. So we're looking at climate change and we're putting all our energies into climate change, but these ecological issues, are there with or without climate change. Climate change will exacerbate them, but they're there anyway. And these, and so these, and these ecological issues are just really, you've got all your major conflicts you've got may revolve around major ecological issues in the background. It, it, it's amazing. So we looked at the country with the most ecological issues in the planet at the moment. It's Afghanistan. Wouldn't believe it, would you? And then sort of we look at then the, the countries with the worst ecological degradation out of the 15 of them, 11 of them are com- currently in conflicts. And the other four, what we put on a watch list for conflict, okay? They, because they're, according to those models I mentioned earlier on, they're probably likely to drop in peace. You go to the countries, which are most e- 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 ecological sound, and they're all up amongst none of them we're in the bottom half of the global peace index. And again, it's back to these concepts of positive peace, but they, it creates the adaptability to be able to solve your problems. In other words, they build the sustainability into the system in many ways. So, okay, where are we going to? So one of the things we're really, lo- really looking at is what are the ways you can actually use business to be able to solve some of these wicked problems. So, so a lot of a lot of this. So, if you look at the undernourishment it, it, globally, it's huge. You've got something like thirty four percent of the world's population is food insecure. It, it, it's a, st- a stunning stat. Now, sort of a lot of the, the agriculture really comes round to the capture of water, and we know that sort of the, in a lot of these parts of the world, you get a lot of water, but it just runs away. So how do you capture the water in an efficient way and then to build an agricultural agriculture out of it at a, mi- at a micro level? So this is, for you, this is for your people who are living on a, a acre of land or a quarter acre of land today. How do you now capture the water so they've got more than one, rather than one crop, they've got three crops a year, then you create cooperatives around it and put in simple manufacturing. So we've done this in a number of different parts of the world, but we're trying to 
bring it together as a system and then look at how do you find the local entrepreneurs who can tackle it. So you see it here a lot of microfinance, and that's where you go and you loan a woman 100 bucks. Then you see a lot of uh, yeah, yeah, IMF World Bank projects where they'll put in a, a couple of hundred million to build a hydroelectric dam. But the MISO level, that 1,000 to 50,000 to stimulate business, there's, no, there's nothing there, no capital for it. And that's the area where I think you can make profound train, change by really working out the business models which can work, funding them, teaching the business models. And the entrepreneurs, the good ones, will just go. So that's one of the areas. The other area is sort of when we look at sort of the human the, uh, uh, happiness or peace, you know, peace, we've got two ways of able to do it. One is we measure it through surveys and the other is through measures of well-being, but they look at they look at uh, socioeconomic measures like uh, are you going, how long are you going to school for, uh, uh, what's your life expectancy, et cetera, et cetera. And both of them are flawed. So I'm working with some technology at the moment uh, uh, where we're going to uh, be using biometric markers to be able to determine the uh, uh, levels of happiness of individuals and their inner peace. So if you're looking at happiness from an Eastern perspective, they look at that as from an inner peace, and that's the equanimity type aspect. So you can take the camera on your computer, which we're all staring in with, Zoom many, many times a day now. And from that, you can look at the sort of veins on the head and determine the changes in the heart rate. You can look at the movement of the eyes and be able to determine factors about that. There's other ways in terms of the muscles and the face and the way they stress. And then you can also take the intonation of the voice and see how it changes. So we're going to be looking We've almost got the technology together on it, but looking, launching a prog program now to be able to search the world to find out who are the uh, uh, most happy people in the world and who are sort of the most peaceful. And from there, what you do then is you now start to under understand the socioeconomic environment around them. And I think, I guess, and I could be wrong, but this is just purely my guess, but I think you go and you get to some of the more, as long as people have got enough food and they're healthy and safe and they've got a strong community around them, I think they're the most happy. And I think maybe in the West, the issue is that we haven't actually got community. And part of that is the invention of the modern car. One of the things I'm noticing at the moment, sort of in the area where I live, we're all in lockdown at the moment, a bit of a shock for Sydney. But so I walk out to the coffee shop each day to get, get a coffee. And who do I see on the street walking around all the time, getting out, getting their half an hour exercise? Because you can't go to uh, pubs, you can't go to restaurants, you can't go and watch soccer games. But all the neighbours. And so you start talking to your neighbours. And you get the scent. Now, I can't go walk down to the coffee shop now without running into a couple of people to talk to. And so it's community. And I can see how, look, in the old days, we had to sort of get out and walk to get anywhere, and we all sort of lived in a confined, pretty confined space, and we had community. We've lost it today. I read once that the start of the deterioration of community was when the modern, when the refrigerator came into pl play, because people used to have to go out to the the markets and and together and get their fresh food and you know bring it home, and so they'd see all their neighbors, you know, daily or every other day at the market, and then suddenly the ability to store food for an extended period of time had them hold up in their house and and that was kind of the starting point and then as you say cars and other things that sort of keep isolating and pushing us further and further away from one another it's really interesting yeah yeah so i don't know that's just my music yeah. and speculation yeah. stuff i think it you're right like you're feeling something somewhat the same yeah yeah so how can our how can our listeners get involved with the work that you're doing Oh, there's a number of different ways. The so first thing I'd recommend is reading the, reading the book, Peace in the Age of Chaos. That'll give all that stuff out. But we've got a whole range of training programs. So we've got the uh, Positive Peace Academy. It's about a four-hour, uh, uh, sorry, about six-hour online uh, set of modules, five modules in it. You can go in and do, do them. That's a good way of just getting acquainted with it. We also train ambassadors. We've got about 3,000 uh, IEP ambassadors now. 
And so that's a little bit more uh, extensive. So that involves uh, 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 usually four training sessions running for a couple of hours, a lot of reading and sort of homework as well. But at the back end of that, sort of you engage in the work we do, and sort of work at postulating it, uh, go and do it in different areas. Got other course on religions and peace. So if you've come from a, uh, a spiritual background, that might be of interest for people. Uh, so that's an, another way of getting involved as well. But look, everyone can get involved in peace if they want to. And at the simplest level, it's next time you go get a coffee, just smile and say something nice to the person who gives you the coffee. It's amazing how if we get a little bit more niceness in our life, how it goes around. I keep telling John, but he, he doesn't listen to me, so maybe he'll listen to you. <laughs> oh, I, I, nah, I can't take that. I, I, I have to say okay. that this, uh, this show has just increased my well-being. I'm wondering whether the veins on the side of my head have gone down <laughs> as a result yeah. of, of spending time with Steve. But you're right. I mean, my, my daughter has um, just uh, started working in a store um, before she goes to university, and the... The anger of some people, you know, is 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 unbelievable. You know, the way that we treat one another, you know, it's uh, it's quite shocking in some respects. So, uh, being a bit kinder, I think, is a, is a great uh, call to action. The other thing I'd be saying on that's so just the concept of displaced anger. It's the number of people you'll get be, have anger build up in them because of the frustrations which are happening through their lives, and this comes back to the system side of it. Uh, uh, and then they'll find an event, and then they'll use that as a catalyst to channel their anger. And I think we we see a lot of that in society, and that's that's dangerous. That's that that can be very very dangerous because the wrong leader can take that and channel it in very bad ways. Hmm. Well, I, I have to say, Steve, this uh, hour we've spent with you has been remarkable. It's um, been uplifting and insightful, and and mm. I think it's given uh, us a lot to think about. Um, so, a thank you for that time, and also thank you for the work you've done because you're raising awareness, yeah. and helping people to join the dots up um, about something that could feel o- otherwise overwhelming. And uh, so, you know, we we laud that. Mm. Um, so, yeah. We, we will encourage on our socials people to get involved and provide links to your website and your book. Um, and on behalf of Scott and I, we just wish you continued success. Steve, thank you so much. Such a pleasure to be with you. Okay, Scott, I'll let you go and get your first coffee of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I already had to. You want to get my third? <laughs> okay. Okay, see you guys. Until next time, remember, the world is evolving. Be kind to one another.